Good evening, everybody. George Donnelly here uh, with uh, my co-host, John Tyner. This is the More Liberty Now podcast where we talk about not just your average criticizing the rest of the world, but actually working on how to move ourselves towards more liberty now in our individual lives, uh, you know, as well as society at large. So how are you doing today, John? I'm doing very good. How are you doing? I am. Uh, I still have a cold. Uh, but I'm feeling a bit better. It's just crazy. It won't let me go. Yeah, I'm glad to hear you're doing better. I can't stand when I get a cold. I turn into a huge baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I know that <laughs> feeling. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, it's a good thing my wife's not home right now. She'd probably tell you all about it. <laughs> hmm. So, so, are we, so are we just going to talk about like Christopher Cantwell or something or like that? or? <laughs> You know, I, I did write up a few notes, but his name did not uh, come up. Yeah, so our topic this evening is um, how libertarians sabotage ourselves. And um, I don't mind. To, I don't mean to call him out. He's just I know he's a controversial figure. So yeah. So for some reason, um, nobody else wanted or, or was able to be on the broadcast tonight except Old Faithful John. <laughs> I, I got to give you props, John. I you are it. extremely uh, faithful in these matters. And I appreciate that a lot. Well, I'm happy to do it. It's it's a lot of fun for me. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. So yeah, how do libertarians sabotage ourselves? And and you know, so I think there's a couple ways. There's on um, the personal level, you know, as individuals, and then I think there's on the level of our day-to-day -day dealings with um, you know people who don't agree with us. And then just to kind of on a general level of our movement, our, our communities really, moving towards our kind of general goals of, of living in a more libertarian society. And I, I think we're really sabotaging ourselves on all three fronts. Yeah, um, I think so too. I think people get really passionate about it. I mean, I know when I had my run-in with the TSA, my first, you know, that was kind of when I first got into libertarianism seriously. And it really spoke to me, and I was like, this is such an obvious thing. Like, if I just go beat people over the head with some logic and economics, they're all just going to see the light, and the world's going to change. You know, little <laughs> did I know, people have been doing this for years and years and years ahead of me and really hadn't had any more success than I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Although, it, I think that time was an encouraging one because so many people were so upset about what the TSA was doing, and we had such a gigantic impact all of us who are working on that that you know we kind of tied up the um, the news with that stuff for a couple weeks and we got um, the uh, the TSA administrator and uh, you know Barack Obama and all that to get on TV and, and defend that stuff yeah yeah but I you know I, I do think I think that the problem comes from uh, fundamentalism. I think a, a, a lot of us, perhaps new people or just people who are like big Rothbard fans, uh, have a, a fundamentalist streak. You're trying to and, pick a fight with me, aren't you? <laughs> and we get into this fundamentalist thing, like you know, 100% freedom right now. And let's you, start shooting cops, right? That kind what's of thing. That? Let's what's start that? shooting cops. That kind of that kind of thing. <laughs> well, that, that's its own brand of crazy, I think. <laughs> But uh, you know, it's like we go fundamentalist, and uh, and that just turns people off. And we go super logical, you know, super rational, super left-brained. Mm -hmm. When when I think that um, you know, I think that one of the benefits of like stateless libertarianism is that it gives us a way to harmonize with people across the political spectrum. Because, for example, in this, in a state society, I'm a radical libertarian anarchist type. But in a stateless society, I would probably be like a liberal Democrat. <laughs> but, I mean, isn't, isn't the problem getting there, though? Yeah. I mean, definitely. like, it's easy, it's easy to say, well, in a stateless society, we'd all get along. I mean, the problem's kind of getting there, right? But I think if we reckon, if, like, if, like, frequently we focus on our differences... We say libertarians are this way and statists are that way, and we draw this, uh, you know, it's us versus them, and you know, this stark black and white kind of thing. But I think if we if we place ourselves in the context of a stateless society, 
And we recognize that in a stateless society, everything is context contextual. And different people are going to be able to have all these different things that we want, you know, because liberty inherently honors diversity. Then I think that we can close the, the space, the intellectual space, between us and statists. We can find common ground with them. And in fact, we can show them how, uh, you know, statelessness advances their goals um, more than the state does and more effectively and more rapidly. And thus, we can build a broad coalition. We have the possibility, the potential to build a broad coalition in support of a voluntary society. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure how I fall. I mean, I'm kind of a nuts and bolts kind of guy. So like, this all sounds real great to me. But like, I'm not sure I understand. Like, down at at the activist level or at the individual level, like what that looks like. I mean, you know, the topic is supposed to be how we sabotage ourselves. And I think, you know, we can kind of touch on that by being like, this is what we should be doing instead of here's what we are doing. But I'm not sure I see how we get there from here, at least. I'm not, you know, like, it seems like you're kind of a big picture guy and you've got a lot of these big ideas, but you're going to have to dumb it down a little bit for me. <laughs> no, not dumb it down. No, not at all. And I like that. I think that's one reason why we're so complimentary is because, uh, you know, I go off on my crazy... Uh, you know, imagination trips, and you're like, well, let's bring it down to earth. And that's exactly one of the things that I want to be doing with this this podcast is bringing all this stuff down to earth. Um, I think that that we, you know, I think it's a mindset thing most of all. In this society, it's everything is a is a statist mindset. There's a central authority, and we have to compete for control of that authority. You know, so it's right. all about: are we going to pass this law or that one? Are we going to elect this guy or that one? And so everything goes through that central authority. And so uh, we get locked into these um, these battles like Republican versus Democrat that are complete distractions. And so I think that we have to, um, as, as hard as that is, we have to walk away from that whole thing or at least mentally set it aside and imagine ourselves already living in a stateless society and start building the institutions that we need, you know. Um, for example, watchdog organizations. Uh, I was in, in line at the supermarket not too long ago, and these two uh, women were in front of me, and they were looking at a magazine cover, and they said, you know, we really have to regulate business. <laughs> and they agreed, you know, we got to regulate business. we got to do it. Somebody should do something. Yeah, there ought to be a law. Right. right. And so, and I thought, you know, uh, these women are absolutely correct. Business needs to be regulated. Um, however, government is not the right or right people to be doing it because of the conflicts of interest, you know, of course, of monopoly, all that stuff. And so, uh, we need to be thinking ahead, not thinking about, you know, Rand Paul or Justin Amash or uh, audit the Fed or not or all this, all that stuff. We need to be thinking, um, you know, 50 years ahead to the kind of, to, you know, how are we going to, uh, in a libertarian society, how are we going to regulate business? Uh, how are we going to solve these problems that people have? We need to take a service provider perspective. When a, a liberal or a conservative says they have a problem with something, we need to think about it not as, you know, let's go find that passage in Rothbard and crush that guy with it. Uh, <laughs> let's, 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 let's think of that guy as our customer and let's solve a problem for him and let's start a business to do it, you know? Or, you know, at least experiment with the idea of doing it. So this, this sounds kind of like in the electronics business, you're kind of talking like an underwriter's laboratories kind of kind of company. You know, like every, I don't think anybody really even knows who they are, but like if you turn over just about any piece of electronics, you see that UL logo on the back. Mm -hmm. You know, and those guys basically make sure your electronics aren't going to blow up or fry you kind of thing. And I don't think anybody makes anything anymore that's not that doesn't have those guys' logo on it. Yeah, and, and things like arbitration, mediation, uh, nonviolent communication. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we can learn, we can start businesses in, uh, we can become recognized experts in them, not just within the libertarian community, but within, you know, the whole world. Um, and, uh, you know, start putting forward ideas um, you know, for other things like uh, cooperatives, uh, mutual aid societies, you know, like uh, like we have this uh, severe economic situation 
where people, uh, especially the most vulnerable, um, you know, can't get enough work. Uh, you know, their kids are getting crappy educations. Um, people are losing jobs. They're getting paid less. Their benefits are getting sucked up. Uh, they lose one job, and then the next job they get just doesn't even come near to the to what they were earning before. Single mothers running around all day. Uh, you know, trying to just take care of their kid. The kid all stressed out. You know, like we need to. Just like ditch the Rothbard and ditch the gun thing and and like start businesses to or 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 just figure out how to help these people. But doesn't that kind of get back to the agorism that you and Joel talked about a couple couple of weeks ago? I think it was. I mean, on some level, not everybody can do that, right? I mean, so at some level, you if you want to start a business, you're going to have to pay tribute to the state on some level, whether it's licensing or you're going to pay your taxes. I mean, you can decide to what level you want to cooperate, but at this point in time, you kind of have to, right? I mean, we don't have, I guess what I'm getting at is we don't have enough of a critical mass, as it were, to get people behind you. Like, if you decide not to pay your taxes, there's not enough people who are going to go along and be like, yeah, we disagree with taxes. Like, that guy shouldn't have to pay them. So, I mean, on some level, I think Rothbard and that kind of stuff is kind of required. But I think by just going in and trying to beat a status over the head with Rothbard, you're not going to get very far. You know, I didn't really get into reading Rothbard or really anything else until after I'd already kind of come to libertarianism. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, on some level, I think he, I think Rothbard has his place. I think it's not necessarily right at the start when you're trying to convert people to libertarianism. I think that we off, we pick a few key things, and perhaps social media or the dumbing down in general of the culture contribute to this, but we tend to pick a few key things. And uh, just use them as you know, like blunt weapons, you know, to knock Back people to stuff, right? With. Something like that. Uh, yeah, you know, like like Rothbard, like um, well, let's see, what is that? Guns, you know. Yeah. We're, we're always talking about guns. Right. Um, and you know the roads. Um, <laughs> my roads. <laughs> yeah, my roads. Uh, you know, and they're just a few key things that we use over and over and over again. And so we start to, to people outside, we start to sound like a broken record, and we start to sound very ideo ideological, very fundamentalist, very uh, stiff, wooden. And uh, that's why sometimes libertarians are described as a closed ideological system where there's no air circulating. And it's because I think that we. You know, I see so many people. For example, I know the Mises, the Mises Institute is 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 awesome and all that. You know, I'm glad. Cool. Uh, I have to stop you. I'm glad to hear you call it Mises because I called it that for the longest time, and somebody <laughs> looked at me like I was an idiot one time, and finally I got corrected. But I'm glad to hear somebody else do that. Even if you correct yourself. All right, uh, sorry. Go ahead. They're awesome and all that, but I see so many libertarians, especially newer people, saying, you know, all right, I'm going to dedicate myself to studying Austrian economics. You know, and I'm going to read all of Rothbard, and I did the same thing with Rand. I read everything that Rand had to say. And, you know, perhaps, like you say, it's a prerequisite. But I also think that people, they, they go down the wormhole into the deep ideology and uh, focus so much on, on the past and people who are, frankly, dead. You know, Rothbard is dead, okay? He doesn't have anything to say uh, about 2014. We're here in 2014. The best ideologies can be reinvented and refreshed for each time. It doesn't mean that the core principles need to be uh, compromised. I don't seek to compromise on liberty. But we need to be able to speak to people who live in 20, 2014. Yeah, I, I, I see your point. I mean, I, I don't think Rothbard's necessarily a prerequisite. I like him because... I kind of have a thing for economics just because it's kind of a field where things you wouldn't necessarily expect happen. You know, like you see somebody clamp down on regulation and then you see business pop up somewhere else to get around that regulation. I just, I find that interesting. So for me to read Rothbard and see that kind of stuff and have it explained, that's interesting to me. But I, the reason I like him is because he, I mean, he talks about more than just economics, but he's really easy to read. But mm. I don't necessarily think he's a prerequisite and I'm not sure that, you know, Somebody who's new to libertarian I was like, ought to go start with him necessarily. You know, I think there's plenty of blogs and you know more recent stuff like you're talking about and stuff probably that's even more relevant to what's going on today. That's probably more interesting reading. Hmm. Um, but I think what I hear you saying is 
the problem the problem that we have as libertarians is we're not just talking to people where they are in their lives. You know, we don't necessarily go to these people you're talking about who are working minimum wage jobs and can't figure out how to, who's going to take care of their kids during the day and explain to them why libertarian solves their libertarianism solves their problems. Mm -hmm. For example, um, five years ago, I went to a, um, a, a demonstration in um, suburban Philadelphia uh, against, uh, what's that thing they call it when the government takes your property? Imminent domain? Eminent domain. Okay. So it was a suburb of Philadelphia. They were taking somebody's building under eminent domain to start a library there. And so it was a really nicely organized demonstration where about 50 or 100 people walked around to the, the homes, the private homes, of the people on the city council who were responsible for uh, this eminent domain thing. And it was great. We went to their houses and we yelled at them and stuff. <laughs> but at the end of the, you know, very this is very, right? what's that? Yes, very yes. yeah. And I, I thought it was great to hold people personally accountable. Um, I thought it was very admirable, very well organized, very inspirational. But at the same time, this was a rich white suburb of Philadelphia. Uh huh. And when we got to the, and everybody, almost everybody there was white, and uh, which is awesome. I'm white. White people are cool. <laughs> Me too. Too, by the way, in case people watching couldn't tell. <laughs> and we got to the end, and I said to the organizers, I said, this has been awesome, you guys rock, uh, inspirational, etc., etc. But next time, can we do this in an inner city neighborhood? And I was, like, booed. You know? What? Yeah, I was booed. And this, and this um, you know, I think that if we, if we want to remain a marginal... Um, you know, movement, political movement, then we should continue what we're doing, which is talk about things that mostly benefit people who have lots of money. But if we want to create a broad-based coalition, which we're going to need, um, you know, to achieve our goal of a voluntary or more libertarian society in the United States, um, and I think it's an important to focus on the United States because the United States is the one who's going out there with the wars and the central banking and the copyright tyranny across the world and all that stuff. And if we're going to if we're going to change the United States, we need to build that broad-based coalition. And in order to do so, we need to speak to more people than just the white people who have money. And we need, you know, we have a great opportunity here. Also, you know, our 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 image is uh, you know, that we're like, you know, the top hat and monocle guys defending the rich people. <laughs> And so if we can find a way to speak consistently uh, you know, to people who are not doing so well economically, perhaps people uh, you know, who are not white, then we can not just grow our coalition, we can not just help a lot of people, but we can also uh, reverse, do a lot to reverse that, that negative image of us. So we're all, we're all coke plants, right? <laughs> so, mm. so I, I just I got my check. Yeah. <laughs> Make sure you send me some of yours then because mine <laughs> seems to be lost in the mail. So I think I want to defend libertarians, not necessarily libertarianism, but libertarians just for a second because I think like what you're talking about, like a, you know, this, this march in, um, in Philadelphia and I've seen a lot of other stuff where like it even happened around here. It's been a few years now, but there, it's here in North County, San Diego, there were a couple girls who got murdered um, kind of over in the more rural area. And it actually happened to, I mean, I can't, I missed the story completely, but I remember hearing like when it was a couple of, you know, rich white girls from a nice neighborhood, the entire community, you know, people running patrols, like volunteering to just go out into the backwoods and look for these girls kind of thing. So it's not just economic things like eminent domain, but where I was going with this is I don't think this is necessarily a libertarian problem per se. I think that when stuff happens like that, I think libertarians. I mean, so sorry, I'm kind of I'm kind of losing my train of thought. I think I think libertarians in cases like the one you describe, libertarians are being lumped in with conservatives who don't like big government. I don't think it's libertarians who wouldn't necessarily rally around people who aren't white. I think that when conservatives get you know conservatives get together and they rally around somebody who's white. Libertarians are like, yeah, let's definitely go for this, but I don't think libertarians can generate the same kind of 
momentum behind people who aren't white. You know, they can't get those conservatives to get on board. Hmm. Sorry, that was kind of a lo the long way around to get to that point. <laughs> hmm. True, although, um, you know, if we can uh, build bridges with people on the left, um, or at least co-participate, although, you know, I've tried, uh, in, when I was in, living in Philadelphia for a little while, a few years ago, I tried going to a few kind of leftist things, and um, I just felt really excluded. Like, I wasn't even wanted there. Yeah, you know? well, and, and like I said, especially in this eminent domain thing, a lot of times you'll find that, I think, I, don't, I hate to paint with such a broad brush, but I think you'll find liberals are say, okay, well, whatever we're doing with this eminent domain, like, we're going to build a park or we're going to build a school, and that's for the greater good. So if we displace five or seven homes and those people have to go buy other homes, that's just what it takes to make society a better place. I mean, I don't think... They just don't have the libertarian mindset for us to even form a coalition, at least in that particular case. Hmm. Although, I mean, you know, we can show up um, and support, you know, like, for example, with the whole uh, Michael Brown thing in Ferguson, it would have been interesting to see a, more of a libertarian presence there, um, especially in in a response, you know. I, didn't, I, did, I was busy. I didn't get around to writing anything about that. But it would have been interesting to see, like, libertarians just kind of stick up the flag and, and say, you know, uh, what we support. <laughs> and <laughs> and not, not in the Stefan Molyneux way of coming down practically on the side of the cops, which was, you know, another shocker from him. Oh, yeah. See, I, I, I come across every, his stuff every once in a while, especially when he talks about, you know, relationships between parents and kids. But other than that kind of stuff, I haven't really followed him very much. So I don't even know what he had to say. I mean... If it's worth it, I mean, maybe you want to spend a minute explaining what he had to say about that. Uh, no, I just saw that he. Um, I, I actually don't pay that much attention. Okay, to him. then well, let's let's move on then. <laughs> okay, I, I generally generally like him, but yeah. But uh, so another thing I think is that, like everybody else, there's a lot of ego involved uh, uh, in, in 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 our in, in activism. I've seen. In myself as well, you know, I'm, this is a self-indictment as well. A lot of, um, you know, like I'm going to go out there and be the big activist, you know, and get my name, you know, printed up and, you know, be the hero and all that. And there's also a lot of ego involved in the whole, you know, Rothbard slam down thing, you know, in 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 like sh this whole uh, game of, um, you know, slamming down statists and proving them wrong and all this thing. And I, I was watching a documentary uh, today about uh, the whole derivatives uh, thing, and they quoted something from Alan Greenspan's bio in which he said early on, you know, because he was an objectivist and he was, um, you know, very tight with Ayn Rand. Right. And basically he, you know, I don't, if have you read You haven't read Atlas Shrugged, right? No. So basically, at the end of Atlas I did, Shrugged... I did see the first two movies. Okay. At the end of Atlas Shrugged, the hero, John Galt, is um, offered the opportunity to take over management of the state economy in order to save it. Okay. And so this is like his, you know, Joan of Arc moment where he, you know, if he, if he, ex like, if he accepts the position, then, uh, you know, he can, you know, be the big state hero... But if he uh, refuses it, then, uh, well, anyway, oh, yeah, if he accepts it, he's violating all his principles. Right, he becomes the thing he hates. Exactly. And Alan Greenspan did that. Right. He became chairman of the Federal Reserve, which is basically managing the economy for the state. Right. So anyway, they, they quoted something from his bio in which he said he decided to advance free market capitalism as an insider, insider, rather than a critical pamphleteer. And I thought, wow, the ego in that, you know, the false dichotomy of either he's going to be like a, like one of the top insiders or he's just a, a critical pamphleteer, a guy handing out pamphlets on the sidewalk. Just a gadfly. Yeah. And uh, that, for me, was a real example of, of the ego, especially that goes into a lot of the political libertarianism, you know, because people... People know that the state is screwed up, but they think, you know, I can go in there and be the hero and save it all. You know, the guy who, I'll get the power and I'll just write my name and dismantle everything. Right, kind of the problem with that statement is that it, it kind of assumes the only way to change anything is to actually become part of the state. 
Is mm-hmm. that kind of where you're going with that? Yeah, yeah, and also just the um, that, and also that he portrayed, you know, the other side of the coin as just being a pamphleteer, you know. Right. Like completely irrelevant gadfly on the sidewalk. Right, just standing out, handing out papers and having people throw them away three steps further down the road. Yeah. So I want to, I kind of want to go back to something you said a minute ago because I think the activism, I think, is kind of an interesting thing. I think it's a little thing a lot of libertarians get into. And I think in a lot of times we do it wrong. You know, we get in people's faces, which I think is kind of a recurring theme, at least so far, that we've been talking about. But you were kind of talking about you know, libertarians kind of competing with each other almost for attention. Like, I've got to outdo the other guy. I've got to be more radical. I've got to, you know, I've got to go out to Washington, D.C. and load a shotgun kind of thing, you know, to get people's attention, not to mention any names. But <laughs> Great example. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think people, people like me have thought, oh, great, this guy's thumbing his nose at the state. But I think a lot of people are like, that's against the law and it's not the way to go. But... I'm kind of losing my train of thought. Where I wanted to go with that is one of the things I noticed early on with libertarianism is like the the people who are real big in the movement who are very well known, it seems like that's the way you kind of get to the forefront of the libertarian movement is to go out and basically promote yourself, you know, and it seems like, I mean, you see the same thing in politics. The best way to do that is to knock the other guy and he's not libertarian enough or, you know, that kind of thing. Hmm. So well, you know, I don't know that I don't know necessarily that I have a point that relates to this. I was just figuring to throw that out there and see if it goes anywhere. <laughs> well, you know, to the credit of the political libertarians, the people running for office, they seem to uh, manage that whole thing with a lot more uh, grace and less kind of in-your-face stuff. You know? Yeah, I like, think you have to if you want to be taken seriously. I mean, libertarians don't represent a large enough political block to get you into office on your own mm, or true. on their own, maybe I should say. Yeah. Like, for example, when I have, um, you know, people like Larkin Rose, uh, Cantwell, um, those type, and even Stefan Malin a little bit, they, they, they just go, like, way out to the extreme to provoke a response, or, or they talk about extreme topics. And in the past, um, when I have had critical things to say about, about uh, Cantwell, uh, he's attacked me personally, and the same thing Larkin Rose. Um, uh, you know, I don't think Kokesh has. Um, and I, I and I, and uh, even though I recently criticized Stefan Molyneux about his use of uh, DMCA uh, copyright, right? Uh, well, he hasn't blocked me on Facebook or anything. So. <laughs> but but he's he's big fish. I'm small fry, so perhaps I it escaped his notice. <laughs> Royal gaze. You know, uh, but just to just to kind of do something off to the side here, I saw one of those Apple Android memes the other day, mm-hmm. and the guy with the Android phone is looking over at the other guy, and he says, oh, I feel so sorry for you. And the iPhone guy says, I don't even think about you. <laughs> yeah, that's a typical <laughs> Apple attitude, isn't it? <laughs> so anyway, I thought that... But that's that's definitely... Kind of really- Relevant it's along the same lines of what you're talking to Molly New kind of thing. I mean, I don't mean to say you're the little guy or anything, but I, I am. I totally am. There are people who sometimes comment on on my YouTube videos and they say, "Why are you even making videos? Look at people like uh, Larkin Rose and Cantwell and Molly New. They have like hundreds of times more subscribers than you." Right. You know. You and I'm like, give up. <laughs> yeah, and I'm like. Well, that's cool. They earned it. You know, they did whatever they had to do. That's cool. I'm right. doing my own thing, you know, and it's not necessarily about popularity. Right. You're and making videos because you got something else to say. Yeah, yeah. And also, I'm not like, for example, uh, Cantwell. It, it was interesting. I watched a video recently where Cantwell and Kokesh talked together about strategy. And uh, Kokesh basically said everybody else's strategy uh, for achieving libertarianism was uh, to take something to the extreme. Agorism was to take, uh, you know, trade to the extreme, and voluntarism was education to the extreme, and uh, Cantwell uh, was basically to kill cops to the extreme, (laughs) and, um, sorry, my son's calling me. (laughs) And and Kokesh's strategy was, wasn't to take it to the extreme, it was to run for president of the United States. (laughs) Um... So you're saying you're saying that these two guys are Cantwell's 
thing was to take it to the extreme, or? Well, Kokesh said the Cantwell thing was to take it to the extreme okay. as well, and and Cantwell said no. All all he all he wants to do is incentivize random people, whoever it is out there, to go out and kill cops. <laughs> Awesome, um, yeah. That's going to attract people like, you know, flies to honey, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it does attract a certain type. And, uh, for example, there was that guy out there in, um, I'm not sure where, like at a Walmart, like near a Walmart or something. Uh-huh. And recently they killed uh, two cops while they were eating lunch a couple months ago. That's right. I remember, I remember reading a blog from Cantwell, I think, about that. And... Um, and then he killed uh, a, a, a private citizen who con was concealed carrying in Walmart. And um, he claimed to be inspired by Kokesh. No, oh, that's too bad. I mean, that doesn't do any good for any of us. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised if he had read some of Cantwell's stuff as well. Um, but these, these kinds of strategies are just kind of insane. I mean, it's hard to even call them strategies. Yeah, I mean, I like reading Cantwell because I think he's very logical in his writing. And, you know, I don't necessarily support going out and shooting cops, but I can follow his train of thought when he writes an article about doing so. But I think the thing that's missing, I mean, and I think his big thing is, this is something libertarians need to talk about. Like, we need to decide whether this is okay or not. And I think that's an interesting discussion to have, but I think it's largely, it's largely an academic one. You know, we don't... Nobody's helped by us going out and killing cops. Nobody's helped by, you know, us getting behind going out and killing cops. That doesn't help, you know, like we were talking about earlier, these people on the street who can't make ends meet, which I think libertarianism and a smaller state absolutely would. Mm -hmm. So, like, like I said, as an academic thing, those are very interesting to discuss, but they're not going to win anybody over to libertarianism. It's funny you should say that they're intellectually interesting to discuss. I, I don't agree. Um, and and uh, uh, another idea came to mind, or sorry, uh, um, like a parallel idea came to mind. Uh, I was watching several months ago, uh, just the beginning of a video where Michael Shanklin <clears throat> was interviewing Dr. Walter Block, in which uh, Block made, you know, they were talking about child rape, you know, and they were exploring it in that kind of Rothbardian, you know, detached from reality, you know, intellectual thing. Right. And Block was like, I, I, I really can't rule out child rape. You know, I, I, like he was saying, like he can't really say that child rape is always wrong. Oh, because gee. he might have to rape an infant in order to save its life. Right. So uh, like, I guess, what the hell is that? Yeah. So I'm not sure we're necessarily saying two different things here. I mean, I think I don't even want to talk about child rape personally. I, I don't think there's ever a case when that's when that's the right answer. You know, if you need to save somebody else's life, like, maybe you explain to them you're not going to rape a child, and that's just too bad for them. So, I think I think shooting cops is... Oh, here's my son in the picture here. <laughs> I, think, I think shooting cops, like I said, I think amongst libertarians, I think that's an interesting discussion at an academic level. I don't think it does us any good to go out and try and expose that necessarily to the outside world and be like, we're contemplating shooting cops. Like, like I said, if, you know, two of us want to get together and privately, I think that's an interesting discussion as far as the non-aggression principle goes and where self-defense starts to play into it. But I think as a, as a PR move for libertarians, like to bring more people into libertarianism, I think it's a total fail. And I think we have to be careful, um, you know, though if, you know, if somebody wants to have that kind of conversation, I don't really think it's wise to have it that publicly. Absolutely. Because, for example, look at that article that Larkin Rose published on copblock.org about when to shoot a cop. That has gotten so much negative publicity for copblock. Yeah. That's, that's, that's actually kind of a marketing strategy is to polarize people so much that they have to respond. And that's the, and uh, that works with a certain part of the population, but it also has, um, you know, like a, like it comes back at you too because you may attract uh, a lot of people to you with that kind of talk. But what kind of people who want to kill cops? You know, do you really want those kinds of people around you? And then the people who are decent, basically decent people, are horrified by that. And they th then they think you're a monster. And right. then you get to where things are where people are talking about treating Coplock as a domestic terrorist organization. And, you know, Coplock 
they, they, there are very many courageous people involved in that, and they do good things, very courageous things, like going out and video recording cops right. who are engaged in, uh, you know, misbehavior. And so, you know, and that's risky. And to put, you know, to associate the brand with an article like that puts those people in danger. Absolutely. And it clouds the whole thing because videotaping is completely peaceful and legitimate. But shooting cops is not. And so it makes it so easy. It plays into the hands of the opposition because they can say, aha, you, they're terrorists and they videotape cops and they distract them, you know. Oh, we better out love at videotaping of cops too, you know. Right. So yeah, that, I think, like I said, I don't think we're necessarily saying different things. As a libertarian, I find that discussion interesting for just just as a where does the non-aggression principle end at? Like where is it at the border? I just find that kind of thing interesting. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, I think I think you're absolutely right. That's not doing that's not doing any good for libertarianism as a movement at all. Mm. So to 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 um, shift a little bit. Another thing that I think is a way that we sabotage ourselves is that we focus on liberty almost exclusively when I think that in reality what we, you know, in the United States we have a considerable amount of liberty despite, you know, all the goings on. But what we're really lacking is responsibility and accountability. And I think that is the other side of the coin that not just powers liberty, but you know, from a public relations standpoint, would enable us to reach out to more people. For example, um, the whole derivatives thing several years ago. I was watching a documentary about that, where even you know they got Alan Greenspan to admit that you know there was a flaw or a mistake or he screwed up or whatever. Um, you know, I, I think that it wasn't the um, you know, I think it was that there wasn't enough accountability. You know, he that whole free market thing that they had going on, the deregulation thing, that was good, but they forgot that the other side of the coin is uh, accountability and responsibility. And so all these banks and whatever get to play with other people's money. And there's no responsibility. There's no accountability in that. And I think that really we need to, to balance out our message to, you know, relax a little bit on the liberty side and really crank up uh, the responsibility side. So I think we spent quite a bit of time last week talking about that when we talked about how to be a libertarian. You know, it's, it was one of the things I pointed out towards the end. Like we spent a lot of time on take responsibility for yourself, and then a, you know we spent a, it seemed like the latter half on make sure you know mentally you can kind of take care of yourself. Um, so I don't want to spend too much time talking about that, but I'm interested on I'm interested in this documentary about that you're talking about. Where do they think the responsibility lies with for these banks playing with other people's money? Because I mean, that's one of the things libertarians do talk about: is it should be a totally free market. There should be no regulation whatsoever. And so the argument, as I understand it, then is that if one of these banks starts playing with other people's money and they don't do very good with it, then the recourse is: I mean, either there's fraud, in which case you actually have a case against them. You know, they lied to you about what they were doing with it. Or the recourse is people start to see that they withdraw their money from the bank and the bank eventually folds. I mean, is there some third avenue that that this documentary contemplated, or is there something else in your mind? Um, no, no. But I think the reality of it is that uh, people at the White House and the executive branch, etc., um, they consider themselves uh, managers of the economy, and so. Um, they want to try to manipulate everything through regulations or lack thereof and uh, when something goes wrong for example there was a case of a big derivatives firm uh, like falling apart uh, long-term capital management yes and um, basically instead of just letting long-term capital management fail and die and crash and the people who uh, were wrapped up in that suffer for it you know be responsible for their failure they convinced the White House, uh, you know, Rubin and Greenspan and whatever, they convinced uh, 14 banks to go and bail out um, long-term capital management. It was like a private bailout. Okay. So I guess where, I guess where I'm kind of going with this is then, you know, when you say Sorry. there needs to be personal responsibility, it seems like one of the things we're talking about here is that, and this is one of the things I was kind of trying to point out to people when, they, when I can't get them engaged enough, is that, the government basically creates this moral hazard, and which is exactly what they did in this case. You know, the everybody, you can't necessarily 
jump all the way to the libertarian society that we're talking about where people withdraw their money and the bank fails because everybody kind of implicitly thinks, okay, well, I'm going to put my money in here and FDIC insurance or whatever, somebody's going to bail out this bank or there's this insurance, you know, government-sponsored insurance sitting behind them. So I'm not sure we can necessarily blame that on libertarianism so much. I mean, the, in, I guess in the case we're talking about, there wasn't a complete deregulation. You know, so everybody wants to say, we deregulated these banks, we tried the libertarian thing, and it totally didn't work, and everybody got screwed. And I guess the point I'm making is that we didn't really try full-on, you know, as it were, libertarianism. Yeah, well, and, and to be, I agree, and to be more specific, uh, the government gave too much liberty, or too much freedom, to um, the financial sector See, without holding them accountable. Right, so I guess what I'm saying is that that's kind of the problem, right? They gave them a little bit of liberty and then didn't hold them accountable, but if they had just given them total liberty, the market would have held them accountable. Yeah, but I think also, um, I, I think it's more complex than that because um, the as long as the government controls the money supply uh, and there's a Fed and central banking and all that sort of stuff, that you know they, they so that you know so what could come out of what you're saying they could say okay we're gonna completely deregulate this sector of the economy and then you know people can rise and fall but if it's still within the status paradigm of the central banking and, and them controlling the money well there's still a lot of potential for things to go wrong there yeah I saw I, I see I agree with you on that point so I think where we're getting to is that Basically, we're not going to convince anyone of libertarianism by, by trying to say we should deregulate the banking industry or we should dere deregulate the airline industry because on some level, they're still going to face some kind of regulation and eventually libertarians are going to get blamed for whatever failure finally occurs. And we're either going to have to spend more time explaining why it's not true libertarianism or why the government caused the failure. So, I mean, to kind of bring this back on topic, I think that's kind of the wrong way to go about libertarianism. I mean, it has its place when you want to explain it in more detail once you've got people to come to your side. But I think, you know, like we were saying earlier, the thing is to go to them where they are. Explain to what libertarianism can do for their particular problem right now. You mm -hmm. know, these government deregulating the markets, you, you know, everything's going to be all puppies and unicorns. You know, it's all pie in the sky stuff, but it's so far removed from anybody's, whatever's going on in people's lives tomorrow that it doesn't really do a whole lot of good in trying to bring people to libertarianism. I think we should really strike the word deregulate and the word privatize from our vocabularies as libertarians. Um, I think that we should look at it as like a accountabilizing things. Um, and I think we should recognize, we should make the point to say that that agree, that think, you know, think these things do need to be regulated. There needs to there need to be authorities that are inspecting these things, these these business operations, and passing judgment on whether they're okay or not. Of course, it should all be voluntary, um, but the government is not a good regulator because there is, as you've said, the moral hazard, and you know it's subject to uh, corruption and subversion. You know, it's it's funny you bring that up. I saw an article in I think it was Business Insider. And there was a guy who was giving a lecture about how the digital world is changing um, life in general. Um, and he kind of talked about winners and losers and that. But he got to the end of the, the uh, discussion and he pointed out that you can buy a presidential election for $250 million by his estimates. And so what he, was, what he actually pointed out was that there's, I guess there's five business schools in the U.S. that aren't named yet. You know, they don't have somebody's personal name on them. Mm -hmm. And he said, the, he said the last one that got named, um, the, I can't remember what he, what it was, but it got named, and the people who bought it or named it had to pay three hundred million dollars. And so he said, you could buy a presidential election for less money than it would cost you to name a business school. Hmm. So I mean, That's... that just kind of goes to your point about corruption. <laughs> That's incredibly sobering. Yeah, I thought so too. But he had he had charts that basically explained how super PACs were um, buying the primaries uh, last time to decide 
you know, he showed how it swung back and forth between Romney and Gingrich early on, and basically, if you could pour enough money into a state, you could swing the primary whichever way you wanted and get your candidate to be uh, the Republican or Democratic candidate. Mm-hmm. Um, and another thing, I think, which, um, you know, another, another way we sabotage ourselves, which you should love, is that um, we focus too much on theory, and we don't focus enough on practicalities. For example, even in some of these recent podcasts where I've asked uh, co-hosts, you know, you know, how can we really bring this down to earth and, you know, concretize it, for, make it concrete for people, and... Uh, you know, people had trouble coming up with ideas. Yeah, I, I mean, especially, I'm guilty of that myself. I'll be the first to admit it. I mean, I love the academic side. That's kind of, that's kind of my thing. I like thinking about these pie-in-the-sky things, and like I said, economics has always just kind of interested me. I, I'm a little bit of a math nerd that way anyway, so that stuff's very interesting to me. And, and so I would like to say that at least last episode when we were talking about how to be a libertarian, I've tried to be like... Here's the things I'm doing. I'm trying to do good things, you know, in my life, good things that affect other people's lives. But as far as going out and telling, you know, the people we're talking about, and you know, I'm not sure, not sure I have anything good for them, to, you know, to say to them. So, it's, and I think it's, you know, when it, when you, we reduce it to only an, an intellectual endeavor, I think it, we're turning it into a little bit of a parlor game. And uh, you know the debates and the you know the the slamming down of of people who disagree with us and stuff uh, becomes part of that game. And the memes, uh, you know, there've been a lot of liberty memes, some really good ones, and they're certainly entertaining. I like them, but they become a part of that parlor game. And so, and then we have libertarians who are not even really living as you know, not even really making that much effort to live as a libertarian. Um, and so. Then um, and, and then you ask questions like, how do we concretize this? You know, how do we start making progress? How do we move this forward? And everybody's like, I don't know, you know. <laughs> and so like, hey, I think we've identified, you know, a problem. Hey, throw that here. guy out of the room. Who's that guy asking questions? Tell him to leave. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I think we th there's a problem there, you know, because we have this this great ideology. Uh, these great ideas, these great thinkers that inspire us, but uh, we're living uh, mostly like statists, and um, it's just become a part of game to entertain ourselves in our spare time on social media. Yeah, I, think, so, there's kind of, I think there's a little bit of, of people are waiting for the switch to get thrown, like they're waiting for the revolution kind of thing, you know, and it's kind of it's kind of goes to what I was saying earlier, like you can you can conduct an agorist business or get involved in agorism, but at some level, there you're not going to get widespread adoption. Or it's going to take a long time because people are afraid to do that because they're afraid when they get hauled into court, you know, who knows whether you're going to get 12 libertarians on that jury or you're going to get 12 statists who are like, this guy didn't pay his taxes, throw the book at him. Yeah. Um, there's a, a thing where people are, a lot of people fall into this like fatalist mindset too where um, you know the collapse is coming the collapse is coming you know all right it's just around the corner and when it cut you know I, I got my guns I got my my dry you know my freeze-dried food uh, I got my cabin in the woods I'm gonna be fine I'm gonna survive and then it's gonna be libertopia you know right is this is disease thinking right and I found myself falling into that kind of thinking in the past as well and uh, it was a little bit destructive in my life, I, I realized. Um, and I'm sh I think it's causing you know, problems for other people as well. Um, I, I, I remember my grandpa uh, was an interesting guy. He's a junk, he was a junk dealer. He collected uh, you know, metal and wood and stuff and recycled it. And, but he was a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. And I remember uh, coming, like more than a decade ago, coming across a little book on his desk. Uh, somebody sent him in the mail because he loved to get stuff in the mail uh, about how about the coming dollar collapse. And I was and I was starting to learn about some of this stuff, and I was like, oh, that, that's interesting. You know, uh, he's interested in this too. How long and I looked at it. Yeah, this was probably ten years ago. Okay. And I looked at it, and I opened it up, and it, the publication date was like 1970. Oh, wow. So they were talking about the dollar collapse even back then. 
So what? That's and I was only, like, oh my bucks. god! You know this. I think this whole dollar. I, I I think this whole dollar collapse thing is really just an ongoing scam. Frankly, <laughs> it's a it's a libertarian scam to get people to buy their gold. Yeah, I think so. I think there's a lot of that involved. I don't. Frankly, I don't think the dollar is going to collapse. These people are really good at keeping things going. Yeah, well, they've got a lot of they got a vested interest in doing so. Yeah, a lo everybody has a vested interest in it. Right. I mean, on, on some level, I suppose I do. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, yeah. Well, I mean, all, I mean, all my all my assets are denominated in dollars. So. And um, you know, even in the 2008, when everything was going to hell, and um, you know, 90% of people who were contacting Congress said they didn't want the the TARP thing, the the whole you know bailout of the banks. It, uh, they still passed it, you know. Right. So um, it doesn't matter, you know. You could have 99% of the population, you know, libertarian anarchists, but um, you know, if you have a status Congress, you're gonna have those people are gonna are gonna do what it takes to keep the dollar going, to keep this whole central banking thing going. I suppose, but I mean, I think if you had 99% is probably a little too high of a percentage. I mean, I know you're kind of using hyperbole to make your your, yeah. your point, but I think like if that point, people are just going to walk away. You know, if nobody elects 500 people to office, they're not really going to have a lot of authority. True, true. Yes, absolutely. And there's another thing uh, that you're what you said about people waiting is absolutely true. Uh, people play this waiting game to see you know who's going to step forward and propose something. That's gonna work, you know. That's gonna it's gonna be like a silver bullet, you know. Right. And every once in a while, some new person steps forward, and everybody's like, "Yay!" You know, this is what's gonna do. And then the person gets embarrasses themselves, or gets arrested, you know, or just or like, says something really stupid, and then everybody's like, "Oh, gotta wait." Saying, or like Rand Paul turns out not to be libertarian at all, despite his constant, "I'm not a libertarian." Everybody's like, "No, this is the guy." Well, you know, there was a, it's funny, there was a thread in the NCAP subreddit the other day quoting something that he wrote when he was in college, and they okay. were like, uh, and the NCAPs in there were like, see, he really is an NCAP, you know? Oh, no. <laughs> and I'm like, ah. Uh. And so I... Um, Even if he was 20 years ago, it's obvious he's not now. I mean, he came out and said it, right? Yeah. Well, you know, um, there's this guy, Dana Rohrabacher. Have you heard of him? I have, but I, I've heard his name, but I yeah, I don't even know who he is. I don't even well, know. He's a he's congressman in ca out of California, <laughs> okay. out of your state. Okay. And he's been in Congress for a long time, at least thirty years or more. Yeah, I, th I think the this space probably in the House, right? I mean, the guys in the House seem to, even though they get elected every two years, they stay in forever. <laughs> yeah, he's in the House. Okay. And um, in the '60s or '70s, he was a contemporary. Of um, Konkin, you know the uh, the guy who wrote all the agorist stuff, who came up right. with agorism, right? And he, he was a, a radical libertarian anarchist, and he went around. He was kind of hippie-ish, and went around and sang songs on his guitar. And one day he realized, uh, you know, this is my speculation, but he just kind of, I'm sure he realized, you know, this isn't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> And so he cleaned up and he put on his suit and he became a congressperson and he's a very powerful um, member of the House. He's a Republican. Uh, he's not really libertarian. Right. And so it's 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 certainly possible for people like Ron and Rand and Dana Rohrabacher and anybody else to flirt with these ideas as a young person and then to realize all these people are nuts <laughs> and they're not doing anything and it's just a, a mind game, a parlor game and uh, you know if I want to get somewhere in life and have some kind of impact then I'm gonna have to you know clean up and, and you know go go mainstream right but and, I mean you can't I don't think that's that's even possible I think I think we're kind of getting off topic or maybe we could say this is the way not to be a libertarian is to run for office but I saw somebody a long time ago basically said running for office, on the idea that you're going to shrink the state or make it more libertarian is just it's wrong-headed. I mean it's the same idea as hiring a CEO to drive down the share price of a company. You know, it's just mm. there's he can't do it. I mean, I suppose he could, but he'd get ousted so fast that your head would spin. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I, we've gone for on for a while and I think we've given people plenty of plenty of uh, examples of how not to be a libertarian, but I think uh, future episodes, like, you know, I think even last episode when we talked about how to be a libertarian, 
I think even even when we said, you know, there needs to be more personal responsibility, I think that's all well and good, but I still don't think we did a very good job of saying, here's some concrete steps you can go out and take to that lead a little more libertarian life, and I think we probably ought to come back to that in a later episode, if not the next one. Well, did you see uh, the little article I wrote up to go along with the, the podcast? Uh, just the post that you had posted up. But yeah, no, it's, it's basically oh, you, mean, that. you mean the last episode, you mean? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did read the one from the last episode, yes. But I couldn't tell you what it said at this point. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry. I got a lot going on. So. Uh, of course, of oh, course. Right. Hey, there are times when I go back and read something I wrote six months ago, and I'm like, wow, you know, I don't even remember writing this. So. <laughs> yeah, and I know I read it twice because I know I remembered it, read it before we did that, and then I went back and read it again afterwards when I saw it when I saw you posted on your website. So. But I, I did but I read think that it, article yeah. had a few concrete suggestions. Yeah, I don't I don't mean to cast aspersions on on your writing or anything like that. I'm just I know I know the discussion is fresher in my mind since I actually participated in that. And like I said, that. I think I think taking personal responsibility. I think there's a real concrete way you can do that in your life. But even that, it was just kind of this pie in the sky. Take responsibility for yourself. You know, make sure you're emotionally centered. And then, even still, I think we could even we could have even done a better job of giving concrete examples of how to do that or very you know that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I know that there's there's a whole personal development uh, kind of uh, mindset, I guess. That you know, I don't know. You, you've but you've read some some personal development stuff. But but if you haven't read a lot of it, it can be, uh, I guess, it can sound jargonish and, and unclear. Okay. Um, but I know I know I used to be kind of anti personal development, but I've read tons of stuff, and so maybe maybe I'm too jargonish with it now. No, but what, I I haven't found that to be true, at least in our discussions. But what do you? So how do you? You know, instead of. Um, doing another episode like with the same title, how can we um, kind of uh, narrow it down? Like, like, So maybe our first episode about how to live, live a libertarian life, we can think of it as like an overview. So how can we kind of, uh, you know, maybe we can then do a few episodes in the future about different aspects of that, examining those more closely. Yeah, I know we, t we touched a little bit last week on it, and I know you and I have talked on about it before, and um, I, I, I'm a big believer that teaching our kids and how we treat our kids is going to inform the next generation. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think there ought to be one specifically on how we raise our kids. You know, I realize it's a touchy subject, and I'm not necessarily sure I want to be in the business of telling other people how to raise their kids, but I think that there's some stuff we can talk about, especially, you know, spanking as far as that goes. Um, not yelling. I think Alex would be good. I heard him mention something about um, peaceful parenting. Mm -hmm. uh, he probably has some information to bring to bear on that subject as well. I think that's that's a very good one, and I would love to talk about that. Having two little ones. I mean, you guys, you saw my son come in here earlier. Mm -hmm. Okay. And and what else? What about adults? You know, because um, I think that there are a lot of adults today who. Um, I don't know. Every adult, you know, kind of struggles with managing time and and you know getting ahead in their career, and uh, you know, you know, saving money, you know, budgets, uh, you know, investing, uh, you know. So what what how do you think we can narrow it down a little more the topics for adults? I think that's even great too. I mean, I'll pull up the spreadsheet and show you how my wife and I manage our budget. If you want to see that kind of thing, um, I think. I think even peaceful parenting, I think um, speaking rationally with your children, I mean, children are, can be incredibly frustrating, and that's why there's such a focus on that, because it's very easy to think, this is a little person whose life I totally control, and I can do whatever I want with them. But I think a lot of the concepts that are taught with how to, you know, taught on the libertarian side with how to deal with your kids, I think those apply to people who manage people in business even. Hmm. You know, spending more time understanding where they're coming from, you know, reasoning with them, not just being like, I'm your boss, do what I say. Hmm. You know, I mean, I think coming in, even in a private corporation, I think saying, I'm your boss, do what I say, has a very statist kind of overtone to it. Yeah, true. True. So I think there's, I think there's a lot to do with relationships, just in general, I think. You know, there's a lot there I think we can unpack. You know, if you want to talk about specific relationships, there's probably a lot there we could do. Yeah, I like that idea. And then, like um, I said, I, I thought I, I brought up saving money last week, so just to kind of come back to that again, I, I've done a bunch of different type of stuff, and it's taken a long time for my wife and I to figure out how to manage our finances because, 
the way we do it is I pay all the bills, but she goes out and does all the day-to-day -day groceries and kind of stuff. So like when we get to the end of the month, there has to be enough money for one or the other. You know, if she overspends on the groceries, I can't pay the bills, and if the bills go up too much. So and then you know, there's supposed to be just some kind of discretionary money. So if she goes out and wants to go to Starbucks, so you know, I'd be happy to explain what we do. I'm sure it doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but I think there's setting up a budget, even having a budget, is huge. Oh, I agree. I agree. Just the like the conscious, you know, just being conscious of money, you know, and where it's going and whatnot is very empowering. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's easier. Like when my wife and I first got married, you know, we didn't have any kids to spend money on, and so we didn't really have a lot of a problem with, you know, there was more money than we needed necessarily. You know, we're living in a tiny little apartment, we're going out to eat all the time, but you know, the the further you get along in life, the more you need to pay attention to that, and I think. The sooner people pay attention to that, the way better off they could be later on. Definitely. All right. Well, let's wrap up this episode. Um, we've had a really good conversation about how uh, libertarians sabotage ourselves. Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, if uh, you know you like the show, you can find this episode of the show at morelibertynow.com/four. The number four. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, uh, you can support us. No pressure. No strings attached. Uh, we'll keep doing this, but if you want to support us, you can go to morelibertynow.com slash support. Uh, John, any final words? No, I think we pretty much covered it, and we went way over time, so I don't want to eat up any more of anybody's time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, John. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you, and I will see everybody next week. All right.